Hi, I'm Ann Buell, class of 1988 and chair of the Pembroke Center Advisory Council. On behalf of the Pembroke Center for Teaching and Research on Women, I'm very happy to welcome you all, the alumni, students, faculty, staff, and community members to this evening's program, Complicating Beauty, a look at the way women look. The Pembroke Center Advisory Council and the Friends of the Pembroke Center who are sponsoring this event are alumni, parents, and friends who support the Pembroke Center for Teaching and Research on Women. We're thrilled to play a part in advancing public conversation around gender and sexuality on and off campus, including through events just like this one. For those of you who don't know, the Pembroke Center was founded in 1981 and took its name from Pembroke College, which had merged with the Men's College a decade earlier. The center continues the legacy of Pembroke College through interdisciplinary research and teaching, exploring social inequalities and examining how categories of difference such as gender, race, class, and religion affect our thinking and our world. The center is a recognized leader in scholarship about gender and sexuality, both at Brown and internationally. The center is home to the educational program in gender and sexuality studies, as well as the Pembroke Center archives. The archives preserve and celebrate the history of Brown alumni, uh, LGBTQ history and feminist theory. And with the support of the Friends of the Pembroke Center, we sponsor research grants for faculty and students, collect oral histories from Brown women, and host a wide array of academic events and programs for the Brown community. I'll add a little plug. We encourage you to visit the center website to learn more and to join the Friends of the Pembroke Center. I would like to thank all of our fantastic panelists for their time this evening. And now I'd like to introduce Marsha Eli, class of 1980, who's going to be moderating. Marsha is a director of programs at the Center for Brooklyn History. She began her career as a television writer, producer, and interviewer, was a concentrator in biology at Brown, and is a fellow member of the Pembroke Center Advisory Council and co-chair of its program committee. So thank you, Marsha, and take it away. Thank you, Anne, and thank all of you for being here. And thank you, panelists, for giving me this opportunity to talk to you about an enormously complex and nuanced and fascinating subject. Looks matter. How we present ourselves is personal and profound and for better or for worse makes a difference in how we are accepted and allowed to function in the world. Koa Beck, former editor in chief of Jezebel and author of the new book, White Feminism says, if people think that you are white, that you are straight, that you are cisgender, that you're a citizen, that you're middle to upper, upper class, they speak to you and assess you in a different and decidedly advantageous way. Toni Morrison put her finger on the damage done to women of color by white Eurocentric beauty standards in her very first novel, The Bluest Eye, which was published in 1970. Her protagonist, the dark-skinned Pekala Breedlove, develops a terrible sense of self-worth and dreams of having blue eyes. And John Berger wrote along similar lines decades ago in his 1972 classic Ways of Seeing. He wrote that a woman, quote, has to survey everything she is and everything she does because how she appears to others and ultimately how she appears to men is of crucial importance for what is normally thought of as the success of her life. And yet, beauty, pride of appearance gives joy. It's a gift of the human condition. How we look and how others look gives us pleasure and identity. And of course, what's considered beautiful changes and shifts. And many argue that that is happening right now. So there's a tension. There are social, political, psychological ramifications of how we look. There's real stigmatization, but also joy, pleasure, positive identity and change. So I come into this conversation with the assumption that we are all participants in beauty culture to some degree, and that that culture is neither all good nor all bad. So with that, we have a few goals for tonight's discussion. 
to surface the empowering aspects of beauty culture and also acknowledge the oppressive and destructive ones. To explore reconciling what have largely been white beauty standards with feminist values and structural inequality. Given the experts we have with us tonight, we want to illuminate the histories and importance of beauty pageants and the cosmetics industry and debunk some stereotypes. We, we wanna talk about the, the determiners who holds power in defining beauty standards, who decides how we measure it and how does that power shift? And finally, we wanna talk about our current moment in time. Have we expanded, democratized and successfully changed the values of the traditional white cisgender beauty ideal what is the impact of today's cultural societal changes and movements? Where will they lead? And what might a new normal for beauty standards look like? To do all of that, <clears throat> I am truly honored to be joined by a panel of extraordinary women. And now please all turn on your cameras if they aren't already, it is my Great pleasure to welcome them and tell you who they are. Marjan Carlos, Brown class of 2005, is a journalist, editorial director, and former senior fashion writer at Vogue.com, where her work explored the intersection of style and culture, an outgrowth of her academic research in gender and African-American studies at Brown and Columbia. Her writing has appeared in the pages of Vogue, Vanity Fair, Essence, Wall Street Journal Magazine, among others. And she hosts her own self-produced talk series, We Need to Talk, at Dumbo House in Brooklyn. She is currently working on her first book, A Survey on Race and Class in America. Marjan, welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I have such fond memories of Brown, so it's good to be back. Hilary Levy Friedman is a sociologist who teaches in the education department at Brown. She is the author of Here She Is, The Complicated Reign of the Beauty Pageant in America, so relevant to this discussion. Her other book is Playing to Win, Raising Children in a Competitive Culture. Hilary is the president of the Rhode Island chapter of the National Organization for Women and the mom of two boys, eight-year-old Karsten and six-year-old Quentin. Thanks for being here, Hillary. It's super exciting. And even though I'm like on campus, I'm not quite on campus because I can't see people, but I'm really glad because my, well, he just turned nine last week, he's in quarantine. So it's almost like I'm stuck in my house, but I'm not because I'm with all of you. So thanks. <laughs> Kathy Pice, who received her Master's of Arts from Brown in 1977 and her PhD from Brown in 1982, is the Roy F. and Jeanette P. Nichols Professor of American History at the University of Pennsylvania. She is an award-winning writer and teacher. Her books explore the cultural history of the 20th century of United States, including the history of women and sexuality, beauty and style, and popular culture. She is the author of many books, including Cheap Amusements, Working Women and Leisure in Turn of the Century New York, Zoot Suit, The Enigmatic Career of an Extreme Style, most recently, Information Hunters, When Librarians, Soldiers, and Spies Banded Together in World War II Europe. But of special significance to tonight's conversation is her fascinating book on the social history of makeup and cosmetics titled Hope in a Jar, The Making of America's Beauty Culture. Kathy's graduate studies at Brown were in American civilization. Welcome, Kathy. Thank you so much. It's really a great pleasure to be here, to be back. Thank you. <laughs> and Deborah Saintville, Brown class of 2010, is an education tech solopreneur, like entrepreneur, but solopreneur. As the first black Miss Rhode Island in the history of the Miss America competition in 2011, she won a preliminary talent award for her vocal rendition of Charlie Chaplin's Smile and was selected as a semi-finalist placing in the top 15. At the end of her year of service and for her work as a youth mentor in Providence, Deborah was honored with an NAACP 
Advocate for Justice and Equality for All Award. She concentrated in Africana Studies and International Relationship Relations at Brown. Hi, Deborah. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for having me, and I'm looking forward to a great discussion. So <clears throat> I'd like to start with a very broad question for each of you and have each of you answer it. And I think we'll start with you, Hillary. As women who have all deeply engaged in beauty culture in different ways, and as feminists, if you consider yourselves feminists, what is your relationship with beauty writ large? You know, given what you know, what are your feelings? Is it something to be celebrated, condemned, a positive way to create self? Are there downsides? I'm looking for your personal perspectives. Well, that's a really big question, but I guess I will start with um, the title of the preface in Here She Is, which is Beauty and Brains. And um, I myself have never competed in a beauty pageant. That's one of the first questions people often ask me. But my mother was Miss America 1970. And I don't say this just to be self-deprecating. We truly look nothing alike. Um, and growing up, one of the ways that I distinguished my identity from hers, um, we, I grew up in Michigan, she had been Miss Michigan, like all my teachers knew who she was, all my dance teachers, like everyone, you know, she'd go to the grocery store and have her face on because people would recognize her. So one of the ways I distinguished myself um, and was a natural way for me to, to distinguish myself was by taking on this identity of being a bookworm. And I actually really recall when I was in high school, I went to an all girls school. I, I went to all girls schools for eight years. And, you know, I remember we would wash our hair like once a week all winter, we wouldn't, you know, shave our legs, even though we had to wear skirts. And it was sort of this wonderful, liberating experience. And my mom would be like, um, please, we have to do something about your eyebrows. And I was like, I do not want to pluck my eyebrows. And she would say, you do not pluck yourself only you pluck chickens, you tweeze your eyebrows. So um, somewhat ironically for me, you know, I always thought beauty and brains were mutually exclusive. Like she was the beauty and I was the brains and that I grew up with a single mom. And so we were um, very connected in that way. And then I went to college and I left Michigan and I came out East and I was an undergrad at Harvard. And weirdly, I started tweezing my eyebrows on my own. Um, and I started seeing this complicated way in which many of my classmates at the time when I was an undergraduate were competing at the Miss America pageant. And that was really interesting to me. Um, and what ended up becoming my senior thesis was something about child beauty pageants and why their mothers, why mothers put their very young daughters in. And of course, I didn't realize it at the time. It took some, some years and maybe some therapy to realize that was a subconscious way to stay connected to my mom. Um, but over the years, my relationship with beauty and brains has um, really become richer and more complicated. And now I totally embrace the fact that I do love sequins and glitter and rhinestones and that's sort of in my blood. And I see it as empowering because it's a choice. Um, you know, I did a Zoom call last night and I had like no makeup on and I was like, oh, I would look so much better with contour on right now. But, you know, I was busy doing other things throughout the day and tonight I put makeup on and like that feels good too. And so the choice aspect of it to me makes it work and it is something that I enjoy. And if I didn't enjoy it, I wouldn't do it, frankly. So that's much more complicated than the history of women and their relationship to how they look in cosmetics, um, which we'll talk about, but I will stop there for now. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Deborah. Let's go to you as a as a um, as a former Miss Rhode Island, and you know, I, I, what is your relationship to beauty? So that's an interesting um, idea of beauty being a choice, and it it sparked the idea in me. Sometimes um, it feels like performing uh, beauty and femininity is not a choice. That's I feel like that's been my experience because when you step out and you choose not to wear makeup, um, you're judged differently. And as a black woman, you're, you know, you get criticism from um, society at large and also in your community. How can you go and represent us like this, not done up in a certain way? So it's, it's I've always felt a really complicated um, relationship to this idea of beauty. Um, but when I chose to do, um, when I chose to do my first pageant, this was about stepping into a new identity, like as a beautiful girl, 
um, because really I grew up as a tomboy, not really raised to appreciate makeup and, and dressing up glamorously. So that was my way of exploring like, oh, I, I can be feminine. I can make it in that world. Um, but sometimes I think it's, it's not a great feeling when you're, you have the obligation to look beautiful in some places, you know? So yes, especially in, in the pageant world where if you, you have a bad day, um, suddenly, you, you know, you're getting criticized by a bunch of people who would rather be in your place. You don't, you know, deserve your, your placement as a title holder when there are so many women who are, who are dying to, to do this and would be ready on a dime to, to look glamorous 24 seven. So it was a lot of pressure. Um, so, and that takes away from the joy that could be the joy of, of, you know, performing a fantasy and, and looking a certain way, looking great. Um, so yeah. Yeah, that's, that's been my relationship with it. Yeah, and I want to talk a little bit more about that later, about the, you know, the pressure to live up to an ideal. Um, but let's move to Marjan. From where you sit in the you know, fashion world, influencer world, what, what, are, what are your feelings? Hi, yeah. Um, I'm just loving everybody's comments. Um, I think that my relationship to beauty now is a place of joy it's a place of experimentation um i think there's so many opportunities to express myself outwardly um, and i use beauty to do that um to take on different personas or to to um to express how i'm feeling in that moment and so i that's how i see beauty being limitless um, but it hasn't always been like that. I mean, obviously I'm a black woman who lives in America and I grew up in the South and I was in predominantly white um, enclaves for pretty much all my life from uh, my neighborhoods to my schools. And um, it was tacitly understood that like, you know, white women were the, were the idea and the, the paradigm of beauty um, and anything, you know, that, you know, that uh, diverged from that was less so. Um, and as a young black girl and that grew up into a young black woman, that starts to take a toll, right? Even though I had so many amazing black women in my life who um, I looked to for inspiration. I, you know, I, I couldn't, as a young girl, I couldn't get over like Aaliyah. I couldn't get over Janet Jackson and, you know, women like that. But as I grew older and I started to study these, the way that um, race and beauty start to inform one another, um, I started to think deeply about my experience and, um, and just about how Black women have historically been written out of the canon of beauty and, or the Western canon of beauty and how I have to challenge that. And so it's kind of a part of my work um, as a journalist to just to fight back at that. Um, and I think one part of that is not only writing about people who feel unseen or um, underrepresented or underserved, but also to challenge myself and, um, and being like, you're enough and you're beautiful as you are um, and having fun with beauty and not thinking of it as a chore. Um, but I definitely understand that, uh, like Deborah was saying, there's a pressure to perform beauty and femininity, um, and women are taught from a very young age uh, that their value is resides in that. So, you know, it's 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 a it, a, a complicated relationship, but one that I, at 37, have have started to really enjoy. Mm -hmm. That's really. That's really great and beautifully said. Kathy, what do you think? Well, um, so I'm of a somewhat older generation than my co-panelists. And um, I'll say that I was in high school in the late 1960s. And I think like all high schools, there were cliques and the A-list and the not so A-list um, people. Um, but I happened to be in high school at this really great moment when you could find this alternative to being really engaged in beauty culture. And so um, in many ways, I'm kind of this strange outlier where I have almost no relationship to cosmetics whatsoever. Um, I have some um, 
gloss over on my right here and I thought, oh, should I put this on or should I just be my authentic self that'll date me really um, far back into the late 60s, early 70s. And I also, you know, came of age as the second wave feminist movement was really taking off. And so um, I, it, you know, part of what I um, kind of absorbed were these ideas about, you know, criticizing the commercialization of beauty and the uh, objectification of women. That's on the one hand. On the other, as a historian and as somebody who is really committed to uh, feminism that doesn't discount women, that the critique is about capitalism or patriarchy or racism, um, I was always interested in the meaningfulness of cosmetics and beauty culture to the women around me. And I really wanted to understand that. I didn't want to discount that in any way. And so my work, it's one of these cases where, you know, those who can't do teach, those who can't do um, wind up writing books on, um, on the history of cosmetics. Mm -hmm. I want to stay with you for a minute, Kathy, because, you know, I mean, there's so much to unpack, unpack around what everybody has said. Um, but I, I, I want to I wanna just put out there that beauty um, is a social construct. Um, and, you know, there was a time when plump women were beautiful because that was whatever, a sign of health, right? Um, and, and I'd love for you to very briefly, Kathy, just, you know, walk us through a little bit of the, of, of the morphing and the changes. So, you know, over time, recent history of what was considered beauty. Yeah, well, I think that there's this really important turning point, which is in the early decades of the 20th century. Before that time, you do have ideals of beauty that might involve um, a, a larger size woman than today would be conventionally called beauty or normatively called beautiful. Um, you had um, really limited use of cosmetics, like color cosmetics um, among women, except for women who were deemed um, immoral or uh, unrespectable. So prostitutes and painted women was a sort of association. And so I think the idea of beauty then was much more tied to a kind of correlation between the inner cell, the inner beauty and outer beauty. But having said that, it's also really clear that the be that beauty was about whiteness. Um, skin whiteners were probably the most um, common form of cosmetics among white women in the 19th century. Um, and we can talk about African American women um, as I, I'm sure we will um, over the course of this discussion. What happens in the early 20th century is I think a real change in how women perceive themselves in the public sphere. Many more women are going into the workplace and employers are requiring a particular kind of look from women, which I think is very important in terms of defining how women understand their appearance um, in general. Um, the motion pictures, pho photography, um, theater, all of these um, uh, media forms are making it, um, making the face and the, the thinking about the face as this um, object to be worked on um, much more common. And it's at the, in the 1920s, you get the idea of um, respectable women using makeup. And I would point to that term makeup as opposed to paint. Um, so paint implies something artificial, um, uh, something that's unnatural, whereas makeup is as though you're making up for a performance. You're yourself, but you're making up for your public role. And so that to me is the real turning point. And there are many changes that take place over the course of the 20th century and the 21st century. But I think that's a really formative one. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are uh, um, forces, um, some forces that you described, um, historical forces and so on. But, you know, I feel like there's something I, that I would really like to dig into, which is the question of power. Um, um, you know, who holds the power? And Deborah, we talked about this a little bit when we met earlier um, as a group in preparation for this. Um, and, and, and I'm wondering where you feel, I'll start with you, Deborah, 
you know, the power lies and whether it's moving. I mean, Marjan works in a world, I think is your work itself is moving power of defining beauty standards. And, you know, and so, you know, what, what do you see? Yes. Yeah, so I, what a trend I, that really stuck out to me recently um, on social media, on Instagram, were those women um, taking glamour photos with like made up um, armpit hair. <laughs> and, you know, I thought that's such a great rebellious way to say, you know, we're not going to accept these standards anymore. Like women have hair, women are human beings. Um, so I, I like that especially younger people, Gen Z is like pushing, pushing the limit more and more and, and retaking power. Um, but it, I would like to hear a lot from Marjan because I know in the entertainment industry and in, in media, like there are those people at the top, especially white cis men who are, you know, dictating the standards for everyone. And what struck me really at the Miss America organization, which was interesting, I don't know um, what Hillary would think, but uh, Dr. Friedman <laughs> would think, but you, it's it's funny how the people at, at the top, you know, we we were. I felt like it was such a historic moment, you know, being part of the history of Miss America, and the people running the organization had so little appreciation for how their decisions um, impacted the culture and impacted people all over. Um, so it's funny how there there was no reflection on on what it was just a normal office. So it's interesting that the people who who have this power just don't reflect on it. They don't think about it. They don't plan and include different voices to shift the trajectory. It's just business as usual. So I like that people are rebelling a little bit and that will shift things a little more. To your to your point, I think that um, social media really democratized media generally. I mean, obviously like editors and writers were, um, the arbiters of, of style, of beauty, um, or just the, the experts and the authorities in particular subjects. But when social media, or rather when the internet democratized um, pretty much everything, you could just log on and you could start reporting, you could start uh, communicating how you feel. And I think that that's how like the dissemination of trends and influences just started coming. And, um, and editors and, and gatekeepers who previously had decided this is beautiful, this is not beautiful, this person is in, this person's out. Those lines started to blur and I think that we actually became observers, more observationists and being like, oh, okay, this actually is happening. I'm gonna go report on this, this trend or this phenomenon or this moment or this person. Um, whereas I think before in media, a few people were given the position to say, this is that thing. This is beauty, this is fashion, this is style and so forth. So I think there's like some real great things in, in social media and and, um, and how liberating it is in taking away the power of, of who gets to decide what is beautiful and what isn't. Um, and I think that we don't necessarily need um, these particular institutions to tell us anymore. Um, other people are, are, are telling us that what they believe is beautiful. And I guess the flip side of, of Pat, when I thought initially of the question, I was like, oh, do you mean pretty privilege? Because I think there's also like a lot of power in being beautiful, which I think that we're starting to talk about um, rather than just people dictating what's beautiful, then that person kind of wields their power and the, and the way that they move throughout the world and like the things that come at them um, and how, and I think that's been really interesting to see play out um, and who gets to change, who gets to shape shift and who gets away with things basically in, in, the, in um, the simplest of terms. So yeah, that's my, that's kind of my thoughts on power. And advertising plays a big role because you know, Beauty Absolutely. And, yeah. and, and, you know, shape shifting, as you say, in advertising, sometimes really flies, sometimes it flops, but sometimes it really flies and, 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 and pushes uh, what is considered cool looking. Um, and sometimes it creates a lot of dis destructive images um, for people who are confused and trying to figure out what they want to look like. No, I think I think you're right. I think, you know, to that same end, 
the reason why advertisements are so important or why covers of magazines are so so important because it's like a visual portrayal of like what our values are or um, who our cultural heroes and heroines are, right? Um, so those things do have value, they do have significance. And I think when you subvert them and you say, actually, I think that women like Lizzo or, um, you know, women who are, are trans, women who um, are, you know, they're, they're different ages, different sizes. I think having that, sh having that push the ideal is really important. And that's why, like you're saying, advertisers, advertisements can either be really destructive or they can actually like create amazing new ideas about how we perceive beauty. Um, which is why it's so important about who is actually at the top making these types of decisions ultimately about inclusion and representation um, and fundamentally what we value, you know. This makes me think so of so many things about your book, Hillary, um, and about beauty pageants. I mean, you know, not only the representation of different body types over the course of beauty pageants, history, um, but also um, the decision that you write about, the conflict that you write about um, that centers on the bathing suit, right? So maybe you can tease that out a little bit for us. Yes, so uh, what became the Miss America pageant started in 1921, celebrating its 100th anniversary, very unusual for something in pop culture in America to last for that long. But there is no doubt and no question that when Miss America began, it was started by a group of men to make money off of women's bodies and their appearance. It was a group of businessmen in Atlantic City, and they wanted to extend the tourist season into September to the weekend after Labor Day. And they came up with this idea of, you know, beautiful girls and, and women in bathing suits is going to make that happen. Um, and if you want to put up the slide, I, I can talk a little bit more about this here because it also links to um, feminism too. So there's no question you can show the second image. Um, the second image is uh, the eight women who competed in 1921. Um, by today's standards, they're super duper covered up. Um, the winner is second from the left there, Margaret Gorman, who's wearing knee highs and not tight. So, I mean, she showed her knees, oh my goodness gracious. Um, and, you know, it really was men and these women truly were not considered respectable, right? Like when you see this image of um, the suffragists too marching, like that was like your street walkers and maybe you're, you know, compared to those painted ladies that Kathy mentioned. Um, now this changes so much over the course of a hundred years. So we go from this image of the bathing suit and you can click on the next picture um, to this was uh, the Miss America 2018 pageant, which was held in September 2017 in Atlantic City pageant math. I can explain if you want, it's a little complicated. Um, and just shout out on the, the woman there in the black bathing suit on the right is Cara Munns, who is a uh, Brown class of 2016, who was crowned Miss America that year. So clearly these women are showing much, much, much more skin. Um, they're wearing six inch heels, which nobody does on the beach. Uh, you can see there are, they're not all white anymore. Um, there's uh, Miss District of Columbia is there. There's one woman, I think she got cut out on this one, but Miss Pennsylvania is Asian, but yet they all look the same, right? Like they're tall, pretty much all tall, thin. They all have this long hair. I mean, this is not always true, but for sure in this picture, they all have this long bouncy curly hair. Um, and they're still wearing these sashes. So I talk a lot about um, the importance of the sash in here she is. So by the time that we get to 2018, for example, and um, what Deborah was mentioning later this year, um, while Cara was Miss America, there was a man who was running the Miss America organization. And uh, this was a few months after hashtag Me Too really became um, such a cultural moment. And emails were linked of him um, you know, disparaging, especially former winners, slut shaming, body shaming, uh, going along with someone else who is using um, extremely unkind terms to refer to women. And after that, and since then, it's been women who have been leading the Miss America pageant. Now, interestingly, you might be thinking, okay, there's Miss America and there's Miss USA. What's the difference? Um, one of the, I say it's the three T's, talent, tuition. And I used to say Trump, but now I say tits. Um, but 
uh, Donald Trump, when he owned Miss Universe and Miss USA, really fulfilled all those bad stereotypes. And much like the businessmen of 1921 who were trying to make money off of women's bodies and appearances. So interestingly, since 2015, within Miss USA and Miss Universe, since he was pushed out after his um, opening remarks, when he declared, when he came down that escalator and declared his candidacy for the president, it has been all women judges all women who've been running the organization. And I think that's quite fascinating if we're talking about where the power is. And because I've looked at a lot of the program books um, historically, even going back over the hundred years of Miss America, for example, it's always been slightly more than half of the judges have been women. We're just seeing an even bigger trend toward that now. And even histories that were done in the 1970s talk about women being um, predominantly in the audience. And if you go to a pageant, you would say, oh, this is very much a female space. So that's the notion that we're dressing for the men, I think does, and the, the women's bodies, especially in their bikinis like this are being judged by men like Donald Trump or this man, Sam Haskell, um, who was pushed out of the Miss America organization. They fulfill those bad stereotypes. But when you're really looking more in the broader sense, these are very female spaces. And most of the contestants I talk to talk about like, oh, well, I'm, I'm dressing to compete with the other women or for what other women think. So that is a very interesting tension that I think has been hinted at in our conversation as well. Fantastic. So I, I wanna talk a little bit about um, the color of our skin. Uh, and I guess I'm, I, I wanna you know, get a sense of whether all of you feel as if um, there's been a shift. You know, Kathy, you write in Hope in a Jar in your, in your chapter titled Shades of Difference. Um, you write, for African Americans, commercialized beauty was not only an aesthetic, psychological, and social matter, but from the outside, outset, explicitly a problem of politics. Cosmetics were never far removed from the fact of white supremacy, the goal of racial project, pro progress, the question of emulation. Um, uh, well, I'd love, Kathy, for you to talk first a little bit about how this has played out over time now. And then I'd like to hear what everybody else says about where you think we are. Uh, yeah, so the, um, the, I mean, there's this really extraordinary and important history of African American beauty culture that has been um, unfolding uh, in recent years by a number of scholars. And one of the things that I think is really crucial is the question of, um, of the relationship between African American you consumers, users of products, and their own communities, and their relationship to white um, beauty standards. And I think it's a really complicated um, kind of a question. There were um, producers of skin whiteners selling to African American um, consumers using black newspapers, for example, in which the appeal to you know, turn your skin 18 shades whiter. I mean, like literally that would be the, um, uh, the sale, the advertising pitch. And it would be accompanied by um, an image of like a transformation of a racial stereotyped face and hair to something that looked more like a, uh, a stereotype of a white elite woman. So the exploitation of, um, of, of, sort of appearance of, of black skin and appearance was a very important one in the, in the late 19th century and into the 20th century. But what's also very striking is that there were black um, entrepreneurs, um, business owners um, who saw a real space for um, businesses that could sell, um, especially hair care products, but also cosmetics to, um, uh, black women. And um, the most well known of these, of course, is um, Madam CJ Walker, um, who, you know, was a uh, known as, you know, the first black uh, woman millionaire, and um, produced an array of products that were designed, 
very, I mean, her, her pitch was this is not about white emulation. This is about respectability, about human dignity, about um, being recognized um, and inclusion. And, you know, we can argue about this, like what it means to have a commercial, a business making those claims, but she was a very strong activist on behalf of um, black advancement and well she died prematurely but in the early 20th century and there were other um, women and men um, who promoted um, products that were really intended to um, bring a sense of pride to um, African Americans so I think that the the politics of it are never um, they're always there in some way whether we want to recognize whether we want to talk about that or not and I certainly acknowledge the idea of the pleasure and joy that you know the play of of, of beautifying of, of, of doing things to your appearance but certainly with respect to African-American beauty culture this was very much a part of the politics of um, you know moving towards civil rights getting rid of Jim Crow um, being recognized as as human beings um, and and so I think that that's a really key part of a story that goes back over a hundred years and of course now it's far more palpable and far more it's really out in the public um, eye and I'd love to hear Deborah um, and Marjan talk about that because they're much more right in the center of the kind of um, of commentary and activism that's happening right now. Oh, well, I, you know, I have a thought, you know, when you, when you talk about this history, I felt this um, sympathy for people trying to survive, you know, feeling the shame of, of um, being judged as less than human. And all you want to do is live a normal life. And how do you do that? except by, you know, trying to fit into standards that are hoisted on you and, you know, damaging your, your skin and your health at the same time, but um, with the goal of, of having an easier life. Um, so it's, it's sad and it's hard today. It's still a huge debate today. And we, we, until I think everyone can be extremely honest and ready to move forward um, without those old standards until we can let them go. We're, we're going to keep seeing problems with colorism. Um, in many parts of the world, you're going to continue seeing um, whiteners. Um, and it's, it's a terrible thing. And it definitely came up at the pageant, you know, because people have certain expectations about, you know, the not only how made up you are, but your skin and your hair, things that you can't change. Um, and they judge you for it and they're they're suspicious about it um so it was it was really it was really hard um i remember a fundraiser um at the you know the, the seagulls david siegel and in, in orlando a million some kind of millionaire um opened up his mansion as a fundraiser for a fundraiser for the miss america pageant and all um contestants were there and i uh there was this gentlemen out of nowhere passing by, you know, they, they invited their, their friends, you know, and the, if you, if y'all remember the Don Imus controversy, <laughs> the phrase nappy headed something came up, <laughs> you know, so, so that while, while this is, this was supposed to be a positive space, it's, it's still really about control and, and there hate underlies a lot of what's supposed to be joyful and beautiful. And that, causes self-esteem issues for people and in their skin color and their hair and, and how they look. So yeah, I have plenty of thoughts on that, but. It's such a huge topic. I mean, I think like <laughs> Kathy, everything you said, Deborah, everything you said, it's like, it's so big. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that black beauty has Historically, it's like been connected to community. Um, you know, if you go to the beauty shop, if you go get your hair done, you're there for hours, and you're like, you're you're really building um, a sense of community with the women around you. There's a real pressure placed on young black women from a very young age um, 
to keep your hair up, your, your hair is your crown. And so there's a lot of like pushing in, um, you know, a lot of emphasis focus on our hair and, and a lot of emphasis focus on our, on our appearance. And obviously, like you're saying, Kathy, that had so much to do with um, citizenship that had so much to do with just trying to validate our own existence. Um, and so it's, it's a very tricky subject. Even today, when I see um, young black women just very like they're just they're very um in tune with how to like do their hair or their makeup and whatever I'm amazed and I learn things from them as well but I'm also like wow you know that's that's an enormous amount of pressure to place on yourself when you're 12 years old um but I definitely do think that at the same time black women should have the right to be as glamorous and as beautiful as they want to be because so you know for so long they've been considered the opposite of those things. We've been considered the opposite of those things. So it is it is a lot. Um, there's a lot of internal things that we um, have to rectify, like Deborah, you brought up colorism, uh, Kathy you brought up uh, whiteners. Uh, and, it's, and it's so interesting because black women are the biggest beauty consumer in the world. So it, <laughs> at, at, at the same time as all these things, like. There's that phrase where it's like, I exist in a world where all those things can be true. Um, so that's how I, those are like the beginnings of it. It's such a huge topic. I mean, I think that could be like a panel in and of itself, like <laughs> truly. For sure. I wanna weave in actually to this, this discussion, a question from um, the audience, from an alum who teaches at an HBCU, which is 69% female who writes, I have seen my female students use beauty slash fashion to signal the intersection of personal and professional success, particularly when it comes to gaining membership to Greek organizations and trying to quote, find a mate. How do you see pressure to be, the pressure to be beautiful or fashionable within particular racial groups playing out? I'll throw this to the, anybody. I think you're, you're muted, Deborah. Oh, I was I was just repeating the the question to myself, gathering yeah. thoughts. <laughs> yeah, that's that's tough. I'll I'll need a second. I don't I know mean, if anyone else. I, I remember there was something that strikes me that I think Kathy, you were talking about, um, uh, you know, in our in our pre call about sororities and the way that the similarity in the way that they look, no matter what their ethnicity and race are. Yes, um, and this is just observational, but I've, I've taken, uh, I've looked at photographs from, um, uh, you know, school albums, class albums from my own university and compared 1910 and 1920 to uh, sorority women and, 2018, 2020, and the um, part of it is about learning how to have your picture taken. Part of it is about presentation um, and that um, young women all have the same smile today. They all have know how to pose in a way that women in 1920 did not. But there's also a certain um, thing about the look. I mean, Hillary mentioned the everyone on in that group of um, Miss America um, contestants kind of looked the same with the long hair. Um, and that may be a little bit, I may be exaggerating a little bit for effect, but I, I think there is a way in which appearance does um, shape communities, um, as Marjan said, um, that it's, it's an important part of bonding with each other, but it also may involve competition. And so it's a kind of odd um, domain that um, can take on many meanings and it's a very social domain. And so it's not just about what women see in the advertisements or on online or on Instagram, but it's also about their own circles and how, you know, how they look to each other within a given um, region, um, institution, social class, race, ethnicity. So I want to um, I want to take some more questions from the audience, but I also want to begin to talk a little bit about what's happening now, 
Um, and some of the questions are about that. Um, well, there's so much happening now, you know? I mean, there's, there's, so, there's so many movements, there's so many waves in our society, in our culture. And I wanna, I wanna ask whether, uh, whether this is a transformational moment in terms of, of, of redefining what is considered beautiful. And um, maybe Hillary, we haven't heard from you in a little bit. Maybe you can kick this off. Well, yes, there's like a million thoughts running through my head, but to, to link this to um, the pageant stuff and many of the things we were, we were just talking about, I mean, this is like really, really, really quick coverage of Black women and in Miss America and Miss USA in particular, but um, you, you might want to put up the slide not to use all my pictures, but I think it would be useful here. So in 1968, because this captures like tension between white feminism and Black feminism, 1968, um, there's this protest outside the Miss America pageant, um, 100 women come, they're talking about how all beauty pageants should, should go away, it's the source of the pejorative and incorrect term bra burner, um, but this is all like the beauty, the cattle auction and get rid of all of these things. And a few hours after that protest down the boardwalk was the first ever Miss Black America pageant, which was organized by the N NAACP and called a positive protest pageant. And those women were not about getting rid of pageants or beauty standards, but to elevate black women's beauty. So this was the image from the New York Times the day after um, both of those pageants and those protests. And despite the fact that Miss America was on network TV, a top 10 show of the entire year, every state was represented in the District of Columbia. So 51 um, contestants, there were only eight or nine contestants at Miss Black America, but they literally take up the same space in the New York Times um, on September 9th, I think it is 1969. And um, this woman who won, Sandra Williams, you'll see that she is not wearing her hair long and in the curls. Um, she's wearing her hair natural. And that was um, not always true for all the Miss Black America winners that would, that would come, but that was very important um, to embrace your hair in its natural way. And, um, Really, I'm skipping ahead here. But two years later, um, there's a Miss Iowa who's the first black contestant on the Miss America stage. So people felt like, okay, that was actually a success, this protest pageant. We don't get the first black Miss America till 1984, Vanessa Williams, who that's a other very complicated um, case to talk about. But in the 21st century, and especially recently, um, even since those images I showed um, from the Miss America 2018 pageant, a year later, the winner of Miss America was a black woman and Miss USA was a black woman and Miss Teen USA was a black woman. And then Miss World was a black woman. And then the, the new Miss Universe right now is a black woman. And some wore their hair natural when they competed. Some wore their hair natural during the year. Um, and they're all different types of hair. It's like short hair, um, very short hair. The current Miss Universe, Miss South Africa wears her hair um, not long at all. The Miss Teen USA who I mentioned had shorter hair. Um, and the previous Miss USA had very, very, very long natural hair. So even in the past few years, there's been just a total change in the pageant world um, in terms of what is embraced. And I would say that like the Miss Black America pageant and many of these other more niche and um, community pageants that were mentioned, the importance of community have changed the broader um, structure of beauty pageants in general. So I'll stop there. Mm -hmm. So uh, anyone else, I mean, how, you know, what about what's happening at this moment in time? Hillary, that was, that was so interesting. Cause I think that's like such a, like a part of this comment that I made earlier. And it's just something that I think about a lot. It's just that um, I think that black women and just women of color should be a part of um, this dialogue on beauty, right? And it's like, I think that the the second wave feminist ideal was that, you know, uh, we, we've got to fight against um, these patriarchal standards and, and whatnot. But um, what was actually revolutionary to black feminists um, and black feminism was an embrace of beauty. And so it, it's very interesting to see those like, to see that side to side, like that tension like that. 
um, because I think that that's like indicative of like a larger historical tension, right? I um, forgot to say they totally didn't talk to each other. <laughs> oh, I'm <laughs> sure they didn't. What was going on? So yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm most positive they did not. Um, so that that's really interesting. Um, I I think nowadays what's going on in beauty. Um, speaking to race is that it, black women have influenced beauty so much so that, um, you know, obviously the, the topic of cultural appropriation comes up very often, um, but physicality, um, that has also in, influenced uh, so much of what we see today. Um, and I think physically black women were considered outside of the norm of beauty for so long, but now this very curvaceous form this, you know, Coke bottle figure is, you know, what you should be after. It's the standard, um, big lips, things, you know, things that black women have been historically denigrated for. Um, you know, it, even the way that we wear our hair with the braids, with, um, you know, baby hair, all of that stuff. It's just like, it's all been co-opted by larger cultures. So it's very interesting to see that type of tension again, where it's like, um, historically black women have not been a part of this conversation on beauty, but now they're largely influencing what we see today. And so much so the plastic surgery world um, has totally changed because of it. And also I would say that Asian women have also influenced the plastic surgery world with this new fox eye phenomenon. I don't know if people know about this, but like now the, the, the rage is to have um, smaller eyes and it, it's it's so interesting to see how those beauty standards change and and, and move um yeah can i add one other thing we didn't and i you might be able to tell from that image i showed of the the women competing in the in the bikinis but you cannot go to a pageant and many other places and not be overwhelmed by the smell smell of spray tan um, like it's unimaginable that you would go on stage and not be like several shades, if you're white, not be several shades darker than you would normally appear. And I don't a hundred percent know what to make of that, but it's like overwhelming. Um, and I'm sure like many of these like real house, there's so many things that we could point to where that's true. And, um, it's just, you know, dancing with the stars, all of that. They talk about the spray tans and, um, I just wanted to mention it because it's, it's a very strange thing. I mean, they tan like the kids too, or you go to dance competitions, but it's like, oh, you have to be dark to be on stage. The excuses to be the stage lights and look like I've gotten a spray tan and I, it does make me look better. I can't, well, makes, makes me look smaller somehow. I'll stop there, but it is very interesting that this has happened too. Yeah, we have, um, there's some questions actually about about tan and tanning um, and also, uh, but I, I also wanna um, focus on some of the questions about the other movements that are happening right now, trans movement, ableist movements. Um, one question says, I recently took a class on the anthropology of disability in which we discussed the intersection of ability and beauty. Do you believe beauty to be inherently ableist? How is, quote, ugliness pathologized and tied to disability and illness? How do we include visible disability in the category of beauty without rom romanticizing it or erasing the difficult realities of disability? Um, so there's some, there's, there's a, a, you know, a number of other rights movements that have happened in the last, you know, 20 to 40 years that I think are also pr playing into what is um, acceptable as, as beauty and not its opposite, meaning ugly. Yeah, just a, a quick comment on that. Um, I, I'm not sure I want to say that um, beauty is necessarily or by definition ableist, but I think it in practice has absolutely been that. Um, there was a, uh, and probably the person who asked the question, having taken that course, knows this. Um, there was a, there were laws that were passed in the early 20th century um, that basically made anyone who was on the 
street who uh, the authorities deem to be ugly or unsightly could be arrested. Um, it's a kind of almost like disorderly conduct, but it was appearance-based and they've become known as the ugly laws. And so that's just, I, I think, a really extreme example in the law of something that is very much a kind of social practice. It, it's, I think that um, certain body types, um, certain kinds of disabilities, uh, it will be very hard to bring them within the domain of beauty. And I think that's a real uh, fight for disability rights um, people. And it's a challenge, I think, for, for every, everybody. And then just a word about the question of trans, um, transgender rights. Um, I think this is, I mean, I, I'm, I'm terrible at predicting anything. Um, you should have asked me about January 6th. I would never have guessed. Um, so I'm a historian, I, I look backwards, but I think that it's very possible that this moment with trans rights um, and especially rethinking trans in terms of gender nonconformity, gender fluidity, of not uh, of really breaking down the binary um, is very important for the potential of beauty to be a much more expansive um, pursuit for um, trans women and trans men um, and conceivably beyond um, those um, pop populations. So I think that uh, and, and also just the attention that's now being paid in the popular media to um, trans performance, um, appearance, I think that that may be a, a critical element in potentially changing beauty standards. Any other thoughts on? Well, I was just going to say in the late 1930s, when um, the Miss America pageant had this new woman who was sort of improbably named Lenora Slaughter come in. She instituted what became known as Rule Seven, which was which said you have to be of good health and the white race to compete. And it only lasted for a few years. And obviously, the, the focus tends to be on the white race there. But the of good health um, is actually quite interesting, and I think links to what we're talking about. And there's never been a contestant on the Miss America stage who has physical mobility issues. Um, there's been a winner who's deaf. Um, there have been other contestants, but no one who needs assistance walking or anything like that. And I think that's really important. Um, there's been one contestant at, at Miss USA who needed assistance walking on stage and Donald Trump actually gave her a special dispensation. He was owner at the time. I mean, she's gone on to start another pageant called Miss You Can Do It, which is for young girls who have um, mental and physical differences. And it's a there's a great documentary that HBO did if you're interested, but these are all things that there's so much work yet to be done. Um, and you can think about like RuPaul's Drag Race, which I would say is the amalgamation of, of beauty pageants and many reality TV shows and, and drag pageants, but just this, um, this new season that just started on the most recent episode, there's a trans man who's competing in drag and that's the first time they've had that. And, um, it's opening up all kinds of interesting conversations. So um, we are definitely moving at a much quicker pace because of pop culture in particular, but these are all things we're seeing lots of progress, but there's so much work yet to do. I actually have a question for all of the other panelists. What do you think will be the future of beauty pageants and will we be able to justify them in the, with the trajectory of, of how society, our society is going. Um, because when I think about these things, you know, you have to have a winner. You have to have someone represent you, whatever the ideal is. And as long as that um, ideal is encompassed in their body, is it going to be compassionate? Is it going to, to be the future we want to live in? Or, you know, will we have to do away with, with pageants? Um, I personally think maybe... <laughs> Even though, you know, I, I really enjoyed my experience, I wouldn't mind if we completely re rethought it, you know, it started off in a way that wasn't very nice and we can, we should change things. So, so that's, that's what I, I'm wondering about. Good question. I mean, I'll jump in again here just because I, I know what it's like when you're teaching the virtual class and no one answers. Um, so I don't, I don't, 
I don't think that Miss America in its current form will, will be around another 100 years from now and maybe not in a decade. That being said, I don't see beauty pageant culture going anywhere. Like I mentioned RuPaul's Drag Race, but just think about The Bachelor. Right now, how many millions of people watched The Bachelor um, last week or last night? Um, and I think there are many, many, many links. I call The Bachelor the new Miss America. Um, and sure, it's someone picking someone who they love, but there's so it's so wrapped up in beauty and there's basically a swimsuit competition every episode and evening gown for the rose ceremony and maybe some sort of like talent broadly, broadly conceived. So I think because looks do matter and because community identity does continue to matter, we're always going to see pageants, but it's just one thing among so many other things we can do. And so um, in the same way that we don't want to force people into some idealized thing. If someone wants to do that now, like, I think that's third wave feminism. Like, if you enjoy that and that gives you pleasure and joy, like, go for it as long as you're aware of all of the other things that come along with it. I, I, I'd like to, can we talk talk for just a minute or two about men? Um, um, you know, and, and, and what is happening with... Um, Things like genderless makeup, you know, there are there are people, you know, men have been, not been afforded the opportunity to preen themselves in the same way as women. There are people who feel bad for them about that. You know, what is your where 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 what does the future hold for that sort of fluid men, women, gender in your views? Well, I think, so I guess this is, this is two parts. It's back to the, your other question and then around, um, or rather the audience's question around like trans and ableism, um, how that may affect beauty pageants. And then, um, yeah, so, and then maybe the future of them. So, I mean, I think that a really good example for me lately has been Rihanna's Savage Fenty shows. I don't know if people have seen those, but those, that is, a really good response to what happened to the Victoria's Secret um, fiasco. And, and when the Victoria's Secret, um, I think it was the VP or president, he made some horrible transphobic and, and able, um, ableist uh, uh, commentary, Victoria's Secret was done. Like the, the runway show was done. And um, Rihanna's kind of flipped that and subverted it and created something that's much more inclusive and uh, much more creative. And it's still like you're saying, Hillary, about beauty and it's about uh, sexuality as well. Um, and so that's not going away, but the way that it's presented and, and, and who's invited in, um, I think will definitely change, um, hopefully. Um, and we'll feel more reflective of what we're seeing um, when it comes to, you know, tearing down the gender binary, um, I hope. Um, and then to your issue, of, to your question about uh, men, I think that, um, I mean, I think straight men and, and their relationship to beauty is always really interesting um, because they don't think that they can have one, but they, but I don't understand why you, they shouldn't have one. And if they, if they enjoy the things, you know, getting their hair cut or, or um, which again, can also be a community based um, exercise. Um, and it can be a form of self care and it can be, it can get rid of anxiety. And, and, you know, men have, we place pressures on men to perform masculinity and to perform a form of beauty as well. We, I mean, we just do. Um, height, baldness, uh, skin clarity, all those types of things. So I think that men should have access to beauty as, as much as they would like to, um, yeah. So um, we are actually running out of time, but I want to, since we're, you know, we've, we, we've moved a little bit to, to some pop culture and the power of pop culture. And, uh, and we have not surprisingly four questions from the audience about Kamala Harris and Vogue. Um, you know, um, these things uh, make a difference. So, you know, please comment on the controversy 
Vogue photographs, Vice President-elect Harris's Vogue cover is an interesting idea. Would a man, any man, not have his choice for the cover photo? photo? Um, can anyone comment on the effect of Kamala Harris on ideas and ideals of beauty? Um, pink versus gold. I, I would love to hear your reactions to this, uh, you know, this other, the other news that's happening in our country right now. Anybody jump in? Marge, I'll, I'll take this. <laughs> And Deborah, but yeah, oh, I was I was going to say really quickly um, when I think of of that situation where you know she wasn't afforded the same um, care that other people would be. Um, we assume why is that, and it, it makes me relate to the pageant experience um, how we're prepared to maximize some people's beauty. We're prepared with their shades of makeup and are made uh, of hair, hairstyles who are ready to, to enhance their hair. But when it comes to maybe um, non-white women, the standards just drop off and, and however you are is how you are. Um, so I'm sure Marjan has amazing thoughts on this, but I just thought, you know, people don't like that. We, and, and it's funny how it still has not changed. So we still have some way to go. Um, so even if we, we don't necessarily need those standards when we're operating under the assumption like we're going to you know take these seriously it's 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 not fair how some people don't get the same care i think that that's been my main issue as well with the cover deborah um it's just the fact that as i said before you know black women have have historically been worked outside of this idea of what beauty is and um I think in these moments when we are celebrated, it's not the time to um, dial down or to appear more palatable. Um, it's this is a time for us to take up space. So I was pretty disappointed in um, the way that the covers were executed. Having worked there, I understand the the enormous amount of politics and uh, pressure that goes into each cover shoot. Um, and I, but I think this is something that. Um, is such a rarity that it, it needed to have a bit more um, a bit more care, as you said, Deborah. And um, it, it's sad that that did fall off because we, as we've seen over the years, women who ha haven't made as much history get bigger shoots and 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 the whole budget and the, and the glam. And I guess that kind of goes back to my larger um, my larger belief is that like we should. Black women, non-white women should have um, a relationship to beauty and they should have access to beauty. Like I know as much as the feminist movement has been trying to um, challenge patriarchal ideas around beauty and, and, and the gatekeepers and what is considered beautiful, I think that there's still like this need to have access to it um, and to feel like you can, you can claim it and own it for yourself. Um, so I wish that 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 could have been the case. And, you know, whether <laughs> she had say in what the ultimate cover it was and versus what it wasn't, um, I would say that there is, I would say that um, stars of that magnitude do have a say. And from what I've known in the past. So it was, it was disappointing. So we end on a note of the unfinished work yet to be done. Um, <laughs> and, and, we're, and it's hard to believe that, that, that we are out of time. Um, it has been such an incredible conversation. I really wanna thank you all. And I feel like there's follow-ups in any number of additional programs that we could um, tease out from some of the things you all talked about. Uh, as a member of the Pembroke Center Advisory Council, I want to um, also thank everybody in the audience for joining us. A special thanks to the Pembroke Center Advisory Council who sponsored today's event, conceived a program on this topic, 
and are thrilled to play a part in advancing public conversation around gender and sexuality through programs like this and in all of the work being done at the Pembroke Center. So please go to the Pembroke Center website for more information on the work and um, thank you all for joining us and, and, and have a great evening. Good night, thank you. everyone. Great to meet you. Likewise. Yes, thanks a lot.